What's going on guys, this is Rob, and we are going to make a video explaining Khonshu, because I feel like that's just one of the major Moon Knight characters that we really haven't explained yet here on Comics Explained, but here's the thing to understand. Unlike Mark Spector, Steve Grant, Jake Lockley, whichever personality you're referencing when you're talking about Moon Knight, Khonshu doesn't really have a direct hand in the various things that go on. He does, but he doesn't. More, th more often than not, he operates behind the scenes. The other part of this is that Khonshu is, almost comes across as much of a villain as he does a hero, depending on what the circumstances are and regarding what Moon Knight's doing, who it is that's writing the story, so on and so forth. So I would say that much like most of the gods that exist on Earth, or at least uh, originate from Earth in Marvel Comics, he's neither good nor evil. If anything, he's really just a dick, is just the best way to look at it. So in Marvel Comics, what you have, and I use this term loosely, right, because I'm not trying to copy DC Comics too much, but what you have is you have old gods and new gods. So the way this played out is that in the beginning of things, in essence, you essentially had just kind of like the Demiurge, right? And this was the idea that the Demiurge represented uh, the Earth's biosphere, right? Just existence on Earth. And that what had happened is that all these different gods had basically been created by the Demiurge along with life. So like Cthone and all those beings. The way this played out though is the old gods basically descended into madness and chaos. And they all ended up just basically attacking each other. And they were all vying for power and manipulating what mortals existed at the time and so on and so forth. And so watching all this unfold, the sentience of Mother Earth, essentially Gaia, ended up going to the Demiurge and then asking to be impregnated with the means by which to destroy these various old gods. And so ultimately she was impregnated with a tomb. And so what ended up happening is a tomb, of course, came into the world and then essentially destroyed all the all the old gods. The only ones who didn't die were the ones who fled, right? So like Cthone took off to his own dimension, other people took off to other dimensions, and then the Earth was quote unquote free. And so following that, a tomb went into the sun and then rechristened himself as Amun-Ra. And then going forward actually had his own offspring. And really Marvel has said over the years that while you do have people like Khonshu, you've also got the Panther Goddess Bast, who Khonshu is a brother to. The Panther Goddess Bast, of course, originating in Egypt and then eventually taking to Africa, specifically in Wakanda to lead the formation of the Panther tribe. So where all the Black Panthers come from, all that kind of stuff. But following that, the, the history was a little murky in the early days involving Khonshu. All we really knew in the old Moon Knight stories was that Khonshu was basically just an Egyptian god. Uh, and that was it. And that Mark Spector was left for dead when he was a mercenary and he was taken before the statue and he agreed to be Khonshu's avatar on Earth. And then Khonshu resurrected him and then Mark Spector went forward as Moon Knight, eventually developing the Jake Lockley, Steve Grant personas and essentially beginning to, or at least starting the process of suffering from uh, dissociative identity disorder, right? Multiple personalities. And so because of this, Khonshu is a perfect example of one of these characters that's introduced into Marvel comics to serve a particular purpose and then over the years just has all kinds of things added to his history or ends up taking on what is in effect a greater role. And so where the first volume of Moon Knight focused heavily on the idea that Mark Spector was just the avatar of Khonshu on Earth, a lot of this changed when you got to Moon Knight Volume 2 and Alan Zelens. And the reason why is because at this point in time, what was basically told to us is that Marvel was trying to find a way to rework Mark Spector's character because the reality was as great as the old Moon Knight story were that there was a desire to shift the character around because interest was essentially dropping off. And so in volume two, what they did is they actually had Mark Spector walk away from the role of Moon Knight, right? Walk away from being a, a vigilante in its entirety. What this did is it led to the involvement of a character by the name of Anubis, or really Anubis the Jackal, who was at one point in time an enemy of Khonshu. But being in possession of the statue of Khonshu and with the statue of Khonshu, at least at that time, largely serving as the means by which Mark Spector could essentially harness the power of Khonshu, it literally put Khonshu's power in the hands of his enemies. And so what this did is it led to Mark Spector essentially coming back and becoming Moon Knight yet again, except this time what he was told is that his powers would actually expand. They would become uh, more prominent with the phases of the moon. Now, this was Old Hat. The power itself or the impact of his powers basically expanding as, you know, essentially on the cycles of the moon. This was a relatively new introduction, right? When it was nighttime and the moon was out, Mark Spector was stronger than he was was when it was just a regular day. That was the nature of the Moon Knight character the way he was originally introduced. Expanding this and having his powers fluctuate and wax and wane based on the cycles of the moon, that was a new concept. And so ultimately this of course led him to going back to, to becoming Moon Knight and then running over the course of volume two. But much like we had talked about in our video on Moon Knight Explained, that Khonshu, even in the early stories, right, the original run of Moon Knight, a lot of what was really given to us was that Mark Spector's role 
role as Khonshu's avatar on Earth was to basically execute the whims and wants of Khonshu. And Khonshu was always given to us as this guy who was basically looking to expand his power. That where he initially approached Mark Spector in kind of a, a benevolent way, right? I am here to help you. I am here to save you. I can give you back the life that you want and let you continue on your path. The reality here is that Khonshu saw Mark Spector as a means by which he could expand his influence. And so while Moon Knight is by no means the most significant threat to anybody on Earth, the fact that he has the backing of a god who is, in truth, more malevolent than he is benevolent, although it does, again, kind of interchange depending on the circumstance, it grants him a level of understanding and power that you don't readily see just because of the fact that gods see everything. And this really came to bear in, really, in, in the, the mid-1980s when you ended up seeing what was, in effect, one of the weirdest stories that was introduced regarding Khonshu, which was actually in West Coast Avengers, uh, Volume 2, Issues 21 through 22. And it was basically this idea that, like, Khonshu wanted to be an Avenger. <laughs> now, the reality of this is that because at this point in time, Mark Spector was already struggling with having multiple personalities, and that at the same time, you had him basically executing the whims and wants of Khonshu, albeit unwillingly, but doing it because he felt he, he essentially owed that just because of the fact that Khonshu had saved his life. It ultimately led to him butting heads with the Avengers. And so what this led to was basically him walking away. The reality of this on a publishing side is that Marvel wanted to put him on an Avengers team and see how people responded. They chose the worst team. <laughs> but, you know, it was interesting to, to see him play out or see his character kind of evolve there, right? But it added a little bit of a, of a little more dynamic to Khonshu, making him a little more human in the sense that as opposed to being some god that exists out there in the Heliopolitan celestial world, right? Just kind of like this ethereal place where the Egyptian gods reside, uh, that he, in a lot of ways, had very human emotions, very human aspects and elements. But again, the reality of Khonshu's character is that where he had machinations and he had schemes and stuff like that, in truth, he didn't become interesting until the modern era, right? Until I'd say maybe the last 10 years of Marvel Comics. That's when he became the absolute most intriguing, more interesting than he'd ever been before. And we actually got more information on him than we'd ever had before. And so if we're being honest with ourselves, a lot of this really started with Brian Michael Bendis. And depending on who you're talking to, Bendis's 12 issue run, which was referred to as Moon Knight Volume 6, uh, that it was a landmark Moon Knight run. Now there are some people who hate it just because you have what's called Bendis speak. Brian Michael Bendis was a writer who just couldn't shut up. So literally the pages would just be filled with talking and it would take forever to get through a Brian Michael Bendis story because they were just constantly talking all the time, right? Just speech bubbles all over the place. But uh, the reality and, and really kind of looking at the nature of the relationship between Khonshu and, and Moon Knight in Bendis's run is it basically led to a breaking point that over the course of his life, or at least his time as Moon Knight, Mark Spector had consistently engaged in these schemes that were basically instructed by Khonshu and that while some of them he disagreed with and didn't follow through with, others he did. But this in combination with his, his disassociative identity disorder, right, having multiple personalities, led him to a place where it even kind of brought back these early day themes of schizophrenia, right? That was the way it was kind of explained in the old Moon Knight stories is that Mark was schizophrenic. Eventually that was changed and it was given to us as disassociative identity disorder, but Bendis built or at least kind of invoked some of those schizophrenic themes by asking questions. And in fact, Jeff Lemire would also build on this later on, which we'll talk about, but it was this idea that Mark Spector didn't know if anything he was experiencing was real. One, we knew he had different personalities. Jake Lockley, Steve Grant, who were at one point personas that Moon Knight had created for himself in order to access different aspects of the criminal element or to operate as a superhero in different, uh, you know, in more effective ways. But during Bendis's run, it also brought in this idea of schizophrenia insofar as, is Khonshu real? Is any of that stuff actually happening? And so all this basically culminated in issue number 12, when he essentially lost his mind and just quit, right? Just disappeared like that. He was just gone. Eventually, he returned in Moon Knight Volume 7 with issues 1 through 17, this whole 17 issue run, and it was cool. But one of the things that ended up going on, and one of the things that, that really began to hit home, is when you got to Moon Knight Volume 8. Now, the truth is that this run by Jeff Lemire, it focused more on Moon Knight kind of curing himself of disassociative identity disorder, albeit something that wouldn't necessarily last, as it was the relationship with, with Khonshu, but it was a phenomenal run. And the reason why is that while it only lasted 14 issues, it is 
is in my mind, the definitive Moon Knight run, right? The absolute greatest Moon Knight run, which I don't think we ever finished and we probably should. But what ended up happening here is that a couple things took place. One, Mark Spector was sent to what appeared to be a mental institution. But what was really revealed here is that whenever it came to Khonshu and these avatars, which again, we'll talk about his really kind of as his newer history that's given to us, um, that the way this would play out is that in effect, Khonshu would wear down the, uh, the, the avatars that he chose on Earth and then quote unquote, at least according to how Jeff Lemire explained it, hollow them out. And what it would mean is they would just be an empty vessel. And what it would do is it would allow Khonshu to enter them as a vessel and then enter the earthly plane with the attempt or the, the desire to essentially conquer it. That so long as, as you know, the avatar of Khonshu had a working mind of their own, they could resist Khonshu, right? They could choose to do the things he asked them to do or choose not to do the things that he asked them to do. And this is really, really important because this fed into like the whole historical relationship between Khonshu and Mark Spector insofar as the fact that Moon Knight wouldn't always do as he was instructed. His conscience would get the better of him. The other part of this, which again, focused more on the Moon Knight element, was him basically reconciling his own personalities. Jake Lockley, Steve Grant, that kind of a thing. Basically coming together and choosing not to ignore him, but instead to embrace them. And that in doing so, they basically destroyed this kind of illusion of, of Khonshu, and in doing so, kind of spiritually freed themselves from the influence of Khonshu. And so going forward, that standard that was set by Jeff Lemire actually reigned supreme for quite some time. Instead of Khonshu having essentially control or such a huge influence over Mark Spector, Mark could choose or choose not to, to be influenced by Khonshu. Khonshu, for the most part, maintained his connection with Mark because he still believed that over time, he could wear him down and then use him as a vessel. The funny thing is that what Jed McKay recently did was totally change that up. Not in the sense of, of, you know, Mark being a vessel, but actually changing the element of Mark Spector being the fist of Khonshu and actually being the only one. Now, there were a couple things that were also invoked here. I mean, there is a lot of a lot of history here that is or is not important, depending on who you talk to, that, that, we're, that we're kind of uh, missing out on. Like, one of the things, for example, is the Sun King, right? Basically, uh, this guy, Patient 86, who essentially was the son of Amun-Ra. And because Amun-Ra and Khonshu had spent so much time fighting each other, um, uh, that basically Sun King was like Amon Ra's avatar on Earth. Uh, we can go into that if you want to, but it's widely considered to be one of the least interesting aspects of Moon Knight's history, right? I mean, Moon Knight fans all over the place are just kind of like, it was a terrible run. And I, for the most part, have to agree, it's not really necessary. Um, Moon Knight, of course, overcomes the Sun King, and you get a little bit of history involving Khonshu, but the problem is the history that you get is actually totally changed and retconned in its entirety. And the reason why is because this goes into a handful of different things. The first thing it does is it goes into what's called the Age of Khonshu, which actually took place during uh, Jason Aaron's run on the Avengers, and then it goes into a story called Acts of Evil. And so one of the things that's given to us, or really the, the way this is explained to us, kind of patch packaging all of this into a really nice, neat little explanation, is that for Khonshu himself, when it came to the Heliopolitan gods, basically the gods of Egypt, as far as human recollection is concerned or documented evidence is concerned, worship of the Heliopolitan gods didn't occur until about 10,000 years ago. So in effect, when the first human encountered Bast, and then a lot of other, you know, several other gods were worshiped at the same time. The truth is that Khonshu actually goes back much, much further. He goes back to about a million years ago, if not before that. The reason being because during the age of Khonshu and even during uh, the, the whole role, or at least kind of the, the one-shot origins of the various Avengers, one of the things that Jason Aaron introduced is you had what were called the Stone Age Avengers. Basically Odin and the Phoenix Force and like Starbrand and different people like that the first Black Panther from a million years ago, which never really made a whole lot of sense, didn't understand why that was done. But in essence, like Khonshu had been around for an exceedingly long amount of time. In order to invoke a more human attribute, a more hu uh, human traits to Khonshu, what Jason Aaron did is he introduced this idea that Khonshu actually wanted to be a part of the Stone Age Avengers, but was declined. And so what ended up happening is he basically formed the first Moon Knight that served the purpose of basically creating problems for the Stone Age Avengers and trying to implement or trying to execute Khonshu's plans and motivations on Earth. Now, in terms of the age of Khonshu itself, this is actually one of those few momentary agreements between Mark Spector and Khonshu, when instead of them just usually butting heads as they always do, that Mark Spector had been struggling with these visions of Mephisto basically leading an army and conquering the world. But Khonshu had experienced those exact same visions. And so what this did is it led Khonshu to really come to this, this realization. He could use these prophetic visions as a means to essentially take over the Earth. And so what he did is he told Mark Spector, the only only way to stop this is for you to steal the power of the Avengers and give those powers to me, which Mark Spector did. And as soon as that happened, 
Khonshu entered Earth and he basically took over Manhattan, he called it New Thebes, and then started ruling from there. Mark Spector, realizing that he had essentially been duped, stole the power of the Phoenix Force, or at least took the power of the Phoenix Force, and then basically defeated Khonshu. And Khonshu was, of course, taken following that and locked in the uh, in the dungeons of Asgard. But in terms of the Acts of Evil story, this was particularly interesting because this is actually a, a kind of initiative or a storyline that Marvel launched, but because they didn't want to disrupt what was going on in the main Marvel continuity, they actually put it in a whole bunch of annuals. Now, for those of you guys who don't know what that means, in, in comic books, you have what are called annuals, which are usually ancillary stories. Sometimes they're important, sometimes they're not. It just depends on what the writer wants to do. Uh, I mean, you could have a story where a writer is like Moon Knight issues one, two, and three, and then annual number one, and it all tells a complete story. But more often than not, the annuals are just throwaway stories. They're completely and totally unnecessary. They may or may not add anything to the story itself, but you don't really need to read them. And so because of the fact that they're just extra stories that are out there, Marvel basically had the entirety of annuals for a whole bunch of different characters completely reworked. And that where you saw characters facing off against different villains they wouldn't normally fight, which made Acts of Evil almost identical to the old Acts of Vengeance story from back in the 80s, that what this did is it actually had Moon Knight face off against uh, against Kane the Conqueror. And so this, of course, was Kane the Conqueror basically trying to find some artifacts that would allow him to maintain his mastery over time without the need of technology. And because Khonshu is the god of vengeance and time, ultimately, Kane the Conqueror ended up going after the artifacts of Khonshu. What it did is it led to Khonshu himself pulling in different Moon Knights from across the time stream, all of whom faced off against uh, against Kane the Conqueror, and then of course, Kane was ultimately defeated. But that's why I say, in the more modern era, Khonshu has been far more involved in the Moon Knight stories than he was previously. That in the old school Moon Knight stories, you didn't know if Khonshu was actually real. You didn't really know if he was an actual person who was there, especially because the early stories relied heavily on the idea of potential schizophrenia in Mark Spector, and they leaned into that, right? Is Khonshu real, or is it a figment of Mark's inability to distinguish between reality and fantasy? Over time, Khonshu has become really a confirmed character to really exist. His motivations are questionable at best. Sometimes he's a good guy, sometimes he's a bad guy, it kind of depends, but ultimately he is there, and Mark Spector basically is the guy who just decides when he wants to go into work. <laughs> Whether or not he's actually going to do what Khonshu tells him to. So, with that being said, guys, if there are any stories here that piqued your interest particularly, um, and you really want to kind of get into the nitty-gritty more than what we were, be, were able to explain here in this video, let me know down in the comments section, right? Acts of Evil and the, the Moon Knight versus Kane the Conqueror story, that was pretty cool. Um, and there's a few others here that are particularly interesting. Um, the Age of Khonshu, we cover that in Jason Aaron's Avengers Run, so you're welcome to, to watch that video. We'll have a link to it down in the description. But uh, yeah, so thanks for watching, guys, and I will catch you all later. Peace.